Good afternoon, introduction to religion. Religion is food sovereignty. Today's class is going to be looking over Wendy Marshall's potent mana and uh, overviewing all three assigned readings that we uh, read over the course of the semester, starting with Alcon and Aguinera's um, edition on food justice, followed by Gretel Van Vieren's uh, book on food justice, culminating with Wendy, Wendy Marshall. And uh, after we have made sense of all three of them, their key insights on food justice and coupling them as a triad to understand the large ongoing debate about how do we uh, gain food justice and how do we define religion through examining and immersing ourselves in this debate uh, on food justice, we can then uh, talk briefly about uh, your final projects, which are gonna be very short and concise um, they are not long at all. So we're going to get to that uh, in the second half of uh, this course, uh, this particular class. So to start off by doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you a particular uh, write up that I've been working on uh, lately. Uh, let's see if we can get it. So I hope you can see this document that I've been working on uh, for actually for quite a while. Um, and this document uh, seeks to achieve two things. First of all, it's gonna be part of this lecture that I'm offering you uh, right now. And uh, secondly, it is going to be, and this lecture is about understanding the three works that uh, we have read over the course of the semester. And then uh, secondly, in addition to that, I also want you to uh, pay attention to how you can uh, gain some, inspiration, I suppose, from uh, this write-up that I've done to write uh, your final exams. Um, and now that the reflection papers have ended, uh, really, I also want you to kind of like um, think about how you wrote your reflection papers and what improvements you could make um, in future, uh, specifically with our particular project, that will be the final exam, the two questions you're going to be answering in the final exam. Uh, but uh, over the course of your uh, future, uh, adventures in, uh, in, in higher ed, uh, applying for jobs, writing cover letters, etc. What other, uh, uh, you know, uh, writing projects that you will engage in, in the future, how can you use some of the, um, uh, some of the things I am doing with my writing and apply that to your writing to improve, not to say that my writing is the best, uh, it is just to say that I experience the same kinds of hardships that you do. And it takes uh, as long for me to write good as it would uh, as it would take for you to write well right so we're both uh, learning english uh, we're both constantly proving upon our writing um, writing is like athleticism writing is like being a sportsman you're never perfect but you can always improve um, and it's tough it, it is a laborious time consuming process but there is a science to it there is a method to it it is not uh, a kind of osmosis that just happens in your mind and you just spot out beautiful sentences um, just like that it takes it, it is not easy to write it is it is an arduous process so anyway so there are two two uh, particular objectives this okay so first of all let's go through the three works secondly let's pay attention to how you can apply this in your final exam learn some insights incorporate insights about the writing in your final exam and in other writing projects that are in in over the years that you will be doing, especially when you think about writing cover letters for, for jobs and etc. So what I do here is abiding by the rules I set for you, I try to create 10 sentence long reflection papers. In this particular case, this will eventually culminate to about a 15 sentence long uh, essay. And it's 15 sentences because I'm giving five sentences to each book that we read over the course of the semester. So with your final exams and with the reflection essays you had to do uh, over the course of the semester, you had 10 sentences long, right? So think about this, how each sentence has a role to play. So what I did is I told myself within five, maximum six sentences, I'm going to be synthesizing each work. And then each paragraph is going to be devoted to one particular book and all paragraphs together, the three paragraphs are going to bring these three books together around one topic. And that topic for us is religion because this course is introduction to religion. So I will just read it out loud and 
we can you can pay attention to the grammatical stuff. I may quickly hint about it, some of the particular methods in writing. Um, and but we're going to talk more about the content and stuff more it's because uh, I want you to be able to understand what were the key insights of each book, and uh, and how you can uh, express those key insights in the final exam as well. Okay, so let's just go ahead and just read it out loud. The ongoing debate over food sovereignty offers rich data for how we define religion. That's the first sentence. In that first sentence, you can see the topic religion come about, okay? So religion is my topic. It's not necessarily the subject, although the two of them can sometimes be the same, but more often than not, the subjects are gonna be diverse. They're gonna change from one sentence to another. The topic, however, never changes. It recurs like a bass beat, boom, 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 boom. It's your rhythm. It is the beat, it's the pulse of your writing. So as you read the, every single sentence, you should see the theme of religion appear in every single sentence in some form or another, while the subject changes uh, with every sentence, ideally speaking. The edited volume in Algon and Alcon and Aguirre, that's my subject for this sentence, hinges food sovereignty on land ownership, comma, citing the nation of example, Nation of Islam as an example. So Nation of Islam is a kind of a religious movement. So religion reappears, it's my topic, and it's a new subject now, the edited volume. Land ownership surfaces as the distinguishing marker of the movement. Movement again refers to the Nation of Islam, which is a kind of a religious movement. The author refers to a farm that the community owns outside of Atlanta, Georgia. No one from the community actually lives on the farm and instead receives the produce once it is transported to Atlanta. That's one of the key insights I gained or observations I made in that one chapter on the nation of Islam, and which is the only chapter that talks about religion in the edited volume. So that's another kind of challenge you can think about grammatically, right? Alcon and Aguirre are actually not books on religion. There's not a lot of religion at all happening in the entire book. There's only one chapter on religion. But I assigned this book in a course on intro to religion. And this paragraph is, the topic for this paragraph is religion. So the struggle I have as a writer is, how can I talk about Elkhorn and Aguirre in terms of what they have to say about religion? You got me? So I could have paid attention to all those various other chapters on the Mississippi Delta, on sharecropping, on enslavement, on Asian farmers in California. But since the theme of religion does not appear in those chapters, it behooved me to not just go through all of those chapters one after another. So this is an example of how when you do your reflection, you're not summarizing or comprehensively going through every single thing that the author does. But instead, you write about what in that particular work is relevant for you. So for me, the question is, what do I learn about Alcon and Aguirre's definition of religion. That is the question that is guiding my work. As a result, what I will do is I will write my reflection on this work around that particular question. So what that means is that I will right away get to the Nation of Islam chapter as quickly as possible because it's the only chapter where they talk about religion without necessarily having to say that. Uh, I don't have to reveal that to the reader because my point isn't to say that they don't talk about religion. My point is to share what they say about religion when they do talk about religion. So you don't have to be very critical of them. You just be very strategic about how you're going to put what you're going to say in every sentence, right? So second sentence is the nation of Islam. Uh, it has to be about nation of Islam because the only place where they talk about religion. The third sentence talks about how they talk about nation of Islam. For them, nation of Islam, it's about land ownership. Makes sense because for them, food sovereignty is about land ownership. The fourth sentence is the, the so, sorry, the, the second, third, yes, the fourth and the fifth sentences are what's happening in that chapter. What's happening is that they mention there's a farm outside of Atlanta, Georgia, but nobody from the community actually lives on the farm and instead the produce is transported to Atlanta where the community lives, okay? So in that two sentences, you can already see a critique that I'm developing about the book, which is that even as it references and mentions religion and devotes a chapter on a particular religious movement, there is very little said about religious practices. 
I don't say that explicitly because I'm going to say that when I talk about Van Vieren, who does pay attention to religious practices, unlike Alcon. But in those two sentences, you can already see the critique developing. Okay, but I want to finish this paragraph by punctuating what the key insight of Alcon is about food sovereignty and how this example makes that argument come about. It does enough with that argument, right? So the example, nevertheless, even though it doesn't pay attention to the back practices, it nevertheless bolsters the overarching argument of the edited volume, namely that food sovereignty rests on producing the food you eat rather than merely consuming items sold at an organic grocery store, which is their main key critique. It's a, a form of critique that many would argue is inspired by a Marxist theory of history, which is that it is all about who is the producer and who's the consumer. I don't have to mention that because it's not a reflection paper on how Marxist theory informs Alcon's work, but it does show a bit of that. But the point is to just focus on religion. That's my theme, right? So what I say in this last sentence is that even though they don't talk about religious practices, they don't necessarily have to talk about it because the example does the job of reinforcing the argument, which is replete across the book. So this is one way in which I don't have to talk about every single chapter in the book or go over multiple chapters in the book while at the same time talking about the entire book, right? So the fifth chapter brings up the entire book. What's the entire book about? It's about this argument that food sovereignty requires you to produce the food you eat rather than consume it, even when it comes to places like organic grocery stores that are nevertheless reinforcing the consumption model. So it's a critical book on the organic grocery store movement as well, right? Uh, especially of, those, of that movement to say to us that we don't need more organic grocery stores. Instead, we need a new model of food system, which is about based on production rather than consumption. Okay, so that's what you get from that first paragraph. Another thing, Pay attention to the first paragraph when it comes to grammatical things. Look at the way in which word choice, in particular, when I talk about word choice, I mean your vocabulary. So you want to use active verbs, whether it's in the past tense or the present tense. And you can see examples of active verbs in the paragraph I wrote, and I will quickly uh, just boldface them for you so that uh, you can see the way in which your word choice matters, the way you can think about strategically what words you're gonna be using in your writing. Okay, so we have here uh, offers, that's one. So we can, let's give it a color. Let's give it a yellow. There you go, offers, hinges. Ooh, that's not a good yellow. Did not want that. I think I wanted, that's better. Hinges, surfaces, refers. None of these words are too fancy. Uh, I suggest Merriam-Webster or you just Google, like find synonym for some word, see if you can find a better word. But these are all verbs that I'm using. They're all active verbs, right? Offers, hinges, surfaces, refers, bolsters, rest, all different verbs. And you want to kind of develop that in your writing as well. So those are my verbs. And recall religion is my topic, OK? All right, now I'm moving to the second paragraph. So the first paragraph was about Alcon how Alcon defines religion. Religion is land ownership, an example of nation of Islam. How we see that emphasis on land ownership, we see it by the lack of talk about ritual practices. And why do we see so much land ownership? How does this nation of Islam example convey the overall point of the book? It is that land ownership is food sovereignty because it allows you to be a producer as opposed to be a consumer, okay? Van Viren, arrives at the same lesson on food sovereignty, which is my way of saying that there is some commonality between Alcon and Van Vieren. Both of them agree that food sovereignty requires you to be a producer rather than a consumer. But unlike Alcon who pays attention to land ownership and land ownership only, for Alcon, land food sovereignty hinges on land ownership, 
Van Viren does so, arrives at the same critique of the consumption model by examining the agrarian practices of religious communities, in particular Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Okay, so now in that first sentence, you can see religion come again, right? So that is my main topic. So I'm going to say Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. You can also already see the sharp shift from Alcon to Van Viren, where Alcon has only one chapter on a religious community that does the argument of all the other chapters. So religion is sort of like a peripheral interest. It is one example of all the examples. For Van Viren, religion is all the examples in the book. Every example has something to do with religion and especially to do with Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, which are two of the biggest religions out there. So now we're going to learn something about Christianity, Judaism, and Islam as a comparative framework, like learn something that they all share in common with each other in terms of their agricultural practices. So what do we learn is that agriculture across these three re religion religions inculcates, that's my verb, because I'm talking about a feeling, an experience, an experience of kinship. Kinship means relationship. So like family, you have kinship to your mother, your brother, sister. But here we're talking about kinship, not just between humans and other humans, but in addition to that, we're talking about a kinship between human and non-human beings, such as water, animals, and plants. Okay, this is the key insight we gain from Van Viren that we potentially do not gain from Alcon, which is that religion is important to food sovereignty, not because there is religious communities that happen to also own land, like Nation of Islam, but because religion offers a guide a method of practicing agriculture that inculcates a feeling of kinship between humans and non-human. It's the experience of agriculture that matters, an experience that is felt in the body because of things you do with the land on which you stand, okay? The kinship dissolves. So now you can see important thing about, uh, so let's give the subject of our uh, sentences an orange, okay? Let's give them an orange. So, you know, you can see the sentences are all gonna, uh, uh, the subjects, my bad, it will all differ. Uh, and you can see how, you know, the subjects are diverse. Okay, orange is gonna be diverse. Red recurs. Doesn't mean you use the word religion, 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 but you have to have some phrase that communicates religion, right? So. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, examples of religion. All right, agriculture across these three religions inculcates an experience of kinship between humans and non-humans. We did that sentence. So the next sentence, I use the kinship as my subject because I've already brought it up in the previous sentence, right? Experience of kinship. The kinship dissolves when cows are genetically modified, comma, rice seeds are patented, comma, and rocks on a waterfall are grounded into a base for plaster and fertilizer. These are examples of agricultural practices that are devoid of religion. How do we know they're devoid of religion? We know that because the kinship, which comes about because of religious religiously informed agricultural practices gets dissolved. So these are examples of how agriculture, when it is not connected to religion and it is devoid of religion, what effects it has on the ecology. These are the ways in which the kinship dissolves, right? Now, what thing with this, one thing with this sentence is, Pay attention to how I am bringing together particular, very, very brief examples that are scattered across the book. So cows are genetically modified. How do I find that out? I find that out in chapter on the animal. And I just search for GMO, genetically modified organisms. And, uh, and what are being genetically modified? What's an organism that is genetically modified? Cows are because we produce more milk when, they're, when we genetically modify them. They secrete more, more milk, they're, 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 they're uh, pouring out milk uh, ad nauseum at all the times, and we need that because we need to put these milk in our grocery stores to be sold, right? So we're, it's a kind of a, cruel, uh, cr a cruelty, but this is something that is very germane in agricultural practices. Now you can see why the kinship would dissolve, because we're actually practicing a form of cruelty towards cows. Cows do not want to be producing milk at all the time. They want to do it when there's a certain rhythm to it. 
but we don't care about the rhythm because we need mass production to be mass consumed at the grocery stores, right? So that's one example. Rice seeds are patented. Patented means that there are certain rice seeds that otherwise would be grown in particular climates, in particular regions, by particular farmers. But when you patent it, you're basically making it homogeneous. You're saying that there is one corporation like Monsanto, for instance, and it's going to have ownership over rice. So all the farmers that have a certain like river that flows and there are certain monsoon cycles that give rise to those rice seeds, they're like, we don't need that. We're just going to patent all rice so that all rice seeds across the world are the same. And they're all owned and distributed by corporations. So even if the farmers are technically farming these seeds, the seed is not owned by the farmers. They're owned by the co corporation like Monsanto because Monsanto ultimately is in charge of paying them to do the farming. They're not farming on their land. They're farming for Monsanto. They're working for Monsanto. So this makes seeds become all the same and seeds lose relationship to their farmers, right? So you can see that Marx's critique of Alcon about production and how it is important to be a producer, otherwise you get alienated. That's no source of notion of alienation is key in Marx. You see this happening in Van Vieren too. Van Vieren doesn't disagree with Alcon about the importance of production. But one of the key shifts is that it's not just saying that land ownership in itself is the main thing. In fact, by the end of the paragraph, we'll see that land ownership is not even the importance, is, is not even the important uh, criteria uh, for Van Vieren when it comes to uh, food sovereignty. So that's one example. And then rocks are on a waterfall or grounded into a base for plaster and fertilizer. All three of these practices I found in different parts of the book. The third one with the rocks I found in the water section, the rice seeds patented, I found that I think in the plant section and the first one I found in the animal section. So the three chapters, three chapter three, four, five, uh, animals, plants, water, in all chapters, I found one particular example of agriculture practice that dissolves the kinship, right? So you can see how the reflection is one where I can talk about the entire book, but I'm not gonna go through summarizing what happens in every chapter. Instead, I'm making the sentences work for me. I'm finding examples in those sentences that go against the religious-based agriculture practices and exemplify contemporary agriculture practices that are devoid of religion. And I start the sentence by saying the kinship dissolves to, because the previous sentence was about how religious agriculture is about that kinship, okay? It's revival, which is the kinship. So here the sentence subject is actually the same as this previous one, but I've rephrased it by saying it's revival. And it's okay, you can re say the same subject twice, but twice should be the maximum. If they're reappearing the third time, that's not a good sign. Even here, I would have probably enjoyed a sentence that doesn't talk about kinship again, but nevertheless, not a bad idea sometimes because I don't want the focus to be kinship, I want the focus to be religion, but religion is about kinship. So that's not a bad thing that it's kind of appearing again and again here. Its revival is transpiring at the very city that was historically designed to conceal nature from us. Okay, so the very city, meaning there's a certain paradox here, which is that we see these kinds of agricultural practices that dissolve the kinship to be trans transpiring in the designing of the city. The city was designed such that, you know, these waterfalls were located where we built a city over it. Um, so when we designed the city, when we built the city, we, we, we concealed nature from us. Uh, nature is, again, that non-human to whom we have a kinship to, right? But now the revival of the kinship is happening in the, way, in the very same city. Well, how could that happen? This sounds like a bit of a paradox. You might have assumed that you're going to go back to a pristine past of a farmland. Now you can see how I'm shifting away from Alcon, because in Al Alcon it was land ownership. Here not necessarily land ownership per se, but about reconnecting that kinship, rebuilding that kinship. Paradoxically, in the very same space where the kinship was dissolved. So last sentence starts with food sovereignty as my subject. And I say food sovereignty not only eludes ownership of land, but moreover nullifies dependency or la on large plots of land altogether. Now, this is the key dramatic shift from Alcon. Alcon was saying we need land ownership. We need farms. We need 
us to be able to produce on our farm. We have this example of the Nation of Islam's farm outside of Atlanta. Here, when we get to Van Viren, no, no land ownership, not even large plots of land. It's actually a burden. So Sheik suggests that food ownership is not about actually having land ownership. It doesn't require land ownership. Instead, it nullifies dependency on land ownership in favor of small scale projects such as communal gardening, indoor farming and foraging. So this is where another part about uh, uh, your writing is uh, consistency with your gerunds, right? So ing, ing, ing. Uh, because the first is ing, the second is ing, the third is ing. Likewise, this kind of like uh, consistency as you can see here, uh, modified, patented, grounded. You want that kind of consistency in your writing. If I had done cows, uh, modification of cows, then that would have been a different kind of phrasing, right? So you want that kind of like consistency in your commas, phrases after commas. So these are practices like foraging, farming, gardening that lay bare the natural ecology of urban landscapes. It allows us to reconnect with nature. So the point is that if you're gonna pay attention to kinship, the goal needs to be build that relationship to the natural world. The natural world is hidden right underneath our cities. So we don't have to go back to the farm. We don't need small scale family farming and go back to some pristine farmland. We need to just remake our cities. Cities is where we live. City is where it's at. City is the site where we have lack of access to food, but the city is gonna be the site where you're gonna find food oasis as well. And this is the key point. You say the city, you say food does it. There is no uh, good food that we have uh, access uh, to. Uh, there are all these grocery stores, all the sugary stuff. But when you pay attention to Van Viren, Van Viren says, we don't need to go back to some farm. We don't need a farm outside the city. We need to see the city differently. We need to put on different binoculars that allow us to see the nature in the city because it's been concealed from us. And it's not really a binocular, it's just a metaphor I'm using, but this is what religion does. Religion allows us to see the city differently, to approach the city differently, to see in the city opportunities and potential and promises for food sovereignty. City as a food oasis, as a food bank, as opposed to a food des uh, desert. And how? It's because we are, the nature that was hidden is becoming re revealed to us again. Okay, so religion is everything to do with the city then, all right? When we pay attention to religion, it's about an experience. Religion is an experience that connects the human with the non-human. This is how we're gonna define religion. And this experience unfolds in urban spaces. So the third paragraph, I haven't finished yet because it takes a while to write this as it takes a while for you to do your reflections. Um, but the first sentence that I think I'm gonna stick with is Wendy Marshall, now we're reaching our third book. She defines religion as an experience that transforms urban spaces into food oases. Uh, through focusing on the feelings of mutual care and reciprocity among local Hawaiians, also known as mana. So mana is my religion again. So you can see every paragraph starts with something about religion. So does the last one, right? Mana is, according to Wendy Marshall, Hawaiian religion. She doesn't think of religion as different denominations, different churches, but instead she talks about religion as a recurrent feeling a feeling of reciprocity and care that brings local Hawaiians together in a relationship to each other and allows them to approach the notion of locality, not as a sign of crime or as a sign of decadence, but rather as a sign of relationship to one another. In other words, think about the ways in which the hood or the neighborhood is oftentimes caricatured or stereotyped as a site of crime and decadence, but it's actually a site of intimate relationships between people sitting by the corner of the street, enjoying their tea or their coffee, talking to one another outside, the car, uh, outside a shop, um, greeting each other, hello, how are you, etc. And it's a form of relationship that is very dynamic. So in other words, it cannot easily be 
reduced to particular ethnic groups or, or racial groups, but rather it's more familial and it's more dynamic. So when you say local Hawaiians, we're talking about people with a bit of Japanese in them, with a bit of British in them, with some American in them, with uh, all kinds of um, hereditary or genetic or ethnic backgrounds, but they all think of themselves as local Hawaiians. They all identify as local Hawaiians. So it crisscrosses and destabilizes the kind of static rigidity we gain from categories of the ethnic or the racial. It's more dynamic than saying, I am a black American or a white American or a people of color American or a brown American, but rather I'm a local, all right? And the local um, could have parents who came from a different country, could have grandparents who came from a different country, um, could be darker in skin color, lighter in skin color, but they all have this kind of familial intimacy with one another. And that's the source of relationship. Relationship is very much bound around their differences, but in that differences, there is this kind of familial get uh, togetherness to it, right? So this, ex so for key point, mana is a religion and it's all about this feeling of care and reciprocity. It is reducible to the feeling, okay? not necessarily land ownership. And then I'm gonna finish the other four sentences from this paragraph as we go ahead, but just let's quickly go through this particular work by Wendy Marshall and pay attention to how you can, uh, synthesize work from, uh, stuff from her work in your final exam, okay? One of the key steps I would suggest for you is that when you open your document, when you go to files and you open Potent Mana, pay attention to the key themes that matter in your answering of the work. Some key words are local, mana, and most importantly, poi, P-O-I, which is this food that is very much animating how local Hawaiians see the purpose or the fruits of their decolonization efforts. So for Wendy Marshall, decolonization, which is another key theme, key keyword as well. So let's add to that. Decolonization, local, mana, and poi. For Wendy Marshall, decolonization is a process of inculcating the feeling of mana, feeling of reciprocity and relationship with, of care with one another. Because colonization induces an alternative feeling of shame, which is hesitancy to identify with fellow local Hawaiians due to fears of crime and other kinds of disease that is attributed to their bodies. So what I would suggest you do is when you open the work is you go to the search bar and you look for uh, search tabs and the best, so press cancel because it might be on highlights. You don't want that, so you want to press the, the crossbar next to the search, and then you say poi. And when you do that, you're going to find all the pages where the term poi appears in the work. So now let's see how, and sometimes it's going to have other words that are like point, but that's okay. You just got to like ignore that. And you got to look for poi. Now the goal for you needs to be to examine how this staple dish of Hawaii called poi allows us to pay attention to the remaking of the city from a food desert to a food bank, okay? Let's see if we're pointing poi. So here's where poi shows up for the first time, okay? Page nine and introduction. So before we get to poi, let's get to uh, this chat, this paragraph, let's start off from here. In the early 1990s, a movement that defined American rule in Hawaii as illegitimate and that demanded sovereignty was gaining ground, okay? The goal of the local Hawaiian sovereignty movement in the 1990s was the return of Hawaiian land and the recuperation of a Hawaiian nation. The movement was comprised of various cultural and political organizations, parties, and practices. As part of a larger movement for cultural revitalization, the focus on sovereignty, which included the most militant and politicized people and organizations, involved slower but growing portions of Hawaiians. So this move of sovereignty is very much uh, uh, big among a particular uh, smaller group of Hawaiians. 
The movement for cultural revitalization was most more widespread and diffuse and was clearly centered on the Hawaiian body. Okay, so this is a key point. We talk about political revival, etc., uh, decolonization. We're not just talking about the abstract transfer of power from Americans to Hawaiians, but we're talking about the very intimate space of the human body. It's happening on the imprints of the body. It's not happening just in a symbolic transfer of power. Feeding the body poi, mash taro root, lau kalu, steward taro leaf, and opihi, limpet, in an effort to improve Hawaiian health via a return to traditional fruits. Adorning the body with tattoos in the form of Polynesian symbols, wearing kihi, cape, and malo, loincloth at protest and other Hawaiian cultural events, moving the body in the hula kahiku, traditional hula in wa'a, kanos, and in kui alua, traditional martial arts. All of these were common expressions of Hawaiian cultural pride in the late 20th century. Okay, so the key theme here is that we talk about decolonization and gaining sovereignty. It happens on the imprints of the body. It doesn't happen in a formal transfer of power where the Americans go and then local Hawaiians are becoming the new political candidates, etc. No, it's not happening in the assembly hall. It's not happening in the Capitol. It's not happening on January the 6th, the way we seem to like become so obsessed about these political events. That's not where power happens. Power happens on the body. And so when we as students of food sovereignty and looking at religion, we got to pay attention to what does the body do? Well, it feeds itself by eating poi, right? Mash taro root. So you can look for examples of poi as well as lau kalu, the stewed taro leaf across the book by searching for poi or searching for lau kalu or searching for taro root or mashed or leaf. And then look at where this term appears over and over again by... Uh, so let's see another part where we can see poi appear. Okay. Ai also refers to the paste made from the starchy root of the kalo known as poi, which was the staple food in Hawaii before the arrival of the Europeans. Embedded within the Hawaiian word for land, aina is a source of sustenance, a concept that was foreign to Westerners who viewed land as a source of profit. Okay. This is a key theme that we see in the previous book on Gretel van Vieren as well. One of the things that Gretel van Vieren argues is that she critiques environmentalists who see religion as causing ecological crises, such as water pollution or soil degradation, etc. Because environmentalists think that land is inherently sacred. They say land is sacred and people, when they do agriculture on the land, they make it messed up. Van Vieren says, no, there are certain agricultural practices that are bad, and these are the practices that dissolve the kinship, but religious informed agricultural practices are actually important to overcome these ecological crises because religious informed practices connect the land with the people. Now here you can see the inverse of the environmentalist when we talk, when she's talking about the arrival of the Europeans. Just as the environmentalist, or unlike the environmentalist, for them, land is inherently sacred. Here for the Europeans, land is inherently about profit. They both have very contrasting opinions of land, but what the two share in common is that both of them neglect the human relationship to land. Okay, so Western secular environmentalists who are very much paranoid about religious agriculture by saying religion is backward and archaic uh, and causes all kinds of ecological crises. We need to like make sure people don't do their religious practices because it's going to make make land get worse they see land as inherently sacred then these europeans that came into hawaii they saw land as inherently about making profit two polar opposites both share in common not paying attention to the human relationship to land okay wendy marshall does pay attention to it so does gretel when we when she talks about religion so this is one of the key themes of religion religion is ultimately about land's relationship to the people and to the people's bodies, not just ownership in a kind of like a priorized sense, like I have ownership of land, so I'm all good to go. No, you have to have that relationship to the land. And one of the ways in which the relationship to land comes about is by thinking of land as a source of sustenance. Land sustains you. So how does it sustain you? Well, it sustains you because it grows poi. Kalo is propagated by means of ahoa or sprouts that form along the root of the plant. According to Pukui, the planter breaks off and transplants the oha. As the oha or sprouts form the patent taro, serve to propagate the taro and produce the staple of light, 
life or eye on the land, aina, cultivated through generations by a given family. So the family or the ohana is identified physically and psychically, psychically with the, with the homeland, aina, whose soil has produced the staple of life, i.e. food made from taro. So point being is that food is produced on a land and that land is in a relationship with you, right? This is that kind of kinship that we saw with Gretel when we were talking about a kinship that uh, uh, transpires over multiple generations. And just pay attention to the way in which the certain Hawaiian words, what they mean. They mean land, they mean life. They uh, like uh, food is the same word as life. Food is the same word as, uh, and land is the same word as sustenance, right? So even the language conveys that kind of relationship, that sort of kinship, which we don't see in the English transliter transliteration of land. In this Hawaiian view, the natural, the spiritual, and human worlds are irrevocably enmeshed in a relationship of mutuality and recipro reciprocity. All right, these are those feelings of mutual care that also are called mana. So if you search for mana, it's going to appear all over the book because the book is about charting the recurrence of mana and mana as key to decolonization. Okay, uh, mana as a source of health, of connecting the bodies with other bodies and bodies with the land. So this is the same kind of point we see with Gretel van Vieren, right? Human, the spiritual, and the natural irrevocably enmeshed in a relationship. This is that kinship. The gods and ancestral spirits are evoked and incarnated in and through the Ai and the Aina. Ai, again, is the food made from taro. So you can search for Ai in your search as well, apostrophe Ai. And what is Aina? The land. All right, so land and food are connected. Nature too is alive, conscious and divine. Identity, kinship, and place are then thoroughly interconnected. Okay, so when we talk about identity here, it has everything to do with place and kinship. It's not identity as in uh, a kind of an abstract uh, sense of sharing some relationship that isn't grounded in the places you live in, but identity is everything to do with the places you live in. So you're, you, you are who you are because of where you are. So the where is really key. The space is really key here. The vitality of each individual is transmitted genealogically, but kinship is also established through substances, substances that dwell in the land. Kinship is about blood, but it is also about land. Land is not just a commodity. The land is part of the ohana, and they care for it as they do the other living members of their family, okay? This is the kind of stuff that Alcon would agree with as well, because the point about land ownership is, of course, being a producer and not being a consumer. So there is that sense of connection. The shift, however, is the shift towards the city, the city as the site where food sovereignty will happen, and the shift away from land ownership and more towards some small scale projects like communal gardens, etc. Right. So in order to understand that shift, we got to pay attention to cities. And here the key city in Wendy Marshall's work is a city called Wainai which is a working class neighborhood outside of Honolulu, quite analogous to a city like Harlem, where Wendy grew up and she compares Wainai to Harlem as well in the book, right? So we see Wainai come in the next paragraph. So let's read that. This could be quite useful as well. When we talk about food sovereignty and city. In the late 20th century, Poi was served in native Hawaiian homes and at community, political and cultural events. Poi was sometimes eaten in ritual silence as a sign of respect for an elder brother, and it was very much perceived as an expression of cultural pride. But Poi had become a commodity, manufactured in factories and sold in grocery stores. This is that kind of organic movement you can call that we see Alcon critique as well, right? This is that consumptive model, which makes us far away from attaining food sovereignty. I spent two hours in a Wainai grocery store one day waiting for the distributor to restock the empty Poi shelves. By the time the distributor arrived, a crowd of 15 or so shoppers had gathered, waiting for the delivery. Because the demand for Poi exceeded the supply, prices were high compared to other staples such as rice and potatoes, and restrictions were often placed on the number of bags of Poi that each customer was allowed to purchase. So this is the problem with consumption, which is that when you have less Poi, the price of poi is going to become higher. Now the price is higher, you have less access to purchasing poi, and you have to purchase other things like rice and potatoes. And then one woman said, you see, we got plenty rice, plenty potatoes, 
But even though poi is the traditional food of Hawaiian people, here in Hawaii, we got to wait in line for poi. So the food that is your tradition, you have no access to because it's not being produced at, at the kind of rate it needs to be produced for the prices to be lowered, right? The wait for poi in the grocery store contrasts with the plethora of local and transnational fast food outlets, outlets that line the main road in and out of Wainai. So the roads of Wainai that come in and out of Wainai are replete with fast food restaurants. You can think about comparisons with Baltimore, how certain streets of Baltimore, you're going to see McDonald's, KFC, Burger King, etc., or other metropolitan cities as well. Uh, Taco Bell, we see the same kind of stuff happening in Wainai as well, right? So there's big line for poi in the grocery stores, coupled with all these fast food restaurants where people are eating junk food. McDonald's, Burger King, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Taco Bell line the main road in and out of town. Some locally owned independent food shops compete with the corporate stores by serving a plate lunch, two scoops of white rice, macaroni salad and mayonnaise, and often fried meat or fish. Although poi was scarce and although community-run farming projects grew kalo and tilapia, they were not in a position to meet community-wide demand. This is the key struggle of food sovereignty. There are alternatives to these fast food restaurants in Wainai, like community-run farming projects that grew kalo and tilapia, but they just cannot meet the community-wide demand. As in the continental United States, Wainai was caught in the tentacles of the transnational food industry that, as Eric Schossler noted in Fast Food Nation, provided tasty but nutritionally, nutritionally and environmentally suspect substance produced by an underpaid and overexploited workforce. So what's happening in Wainai is quite similar to what's happening in the American cities. It's the packaged food, which requires intense heat or nothing at all to be cooked. You can think about the example I shared in the lecture where I'm making dal and I compare the dal I made with the Trader Joe's dal. It's no different. We eat at home, but we come back, we put it in our microwave and then we eat it at home, right? This is a key theme because when we think about home, it is a site of privacy, but home can be two different places. Home can be a space where you're all by yourself. You go to the grocery store, you buy something from Trader Joe's, and then you heat it up and you eat by yourself. But home could be also thought in a different way where it's a site where people come together. In that case, it's not so much a site of privacy, but as much as a site of remaking the city altogether, where the home is the site where it's anchored, uh, of, where you're anchoring your imagination of a new city. So home can become a communal site. This could be very useful for you when you think about your final projects, because if you are going to pay attention to a home as a site where food sovereignty could potentially take place in Baltimore, the home will probably look a lot different than this kind of like an atomized home where you have an individual living, an individual family completely divorced from other people in the neighborhood, etc. But rather home would then become very much connected to other homes. We see this happening in Detroit when I talk about Sister Clara Muhammad and how she was such a key figure in food sovereignty for Nation of Islam. Remember, my story had nothing to do with the farm and in fact had everything to do with the city because Clara was raising eight children in Detroit in the aftermath of the Great Depression. And she was adept at finding this recipe for the bean soup, which became key to this new community she formed of this new community of Muslims on Hastings Street, right? That is an example of home, not as atomized, but as connected. So this is a really key theme when you do your final projects. Maybe the home is important for you, but that home will probably look different than how you routinely think about home as a kind of a private space disconnected with other uh, people. Okay, so what I want you to look for is the ways in which mana is key to the decolonization efforts of local Hawaiians. Pay attention to how, how mana uh, is something you cultivate through eating poi. And does Wendy talk about mana in the context of how people are now cultivating mana away, right? So she gives an example of the community-wide, uh, this community-run farming projects. Are there other projects such as that happening? You will see chapter five, I think there's more poi. There's a, a, a description of poi in this footnote. It's prepared by cooking the starchy root of the taro plant and then pounding it into a paste that is kneaded with water to form a pudding-like substance. It is sometimes fermented for sour poi. Um, but I'm, 
unsure as to whether or not for Wendy, Poe is making a comeback in Wainai or not. This is the key thing, right? So she's paying attention to how people are trying to decolonize Wainai. Decolonization is happening through recultivating, the reviving that feeling of care. How is Poe enabling this feeling of care in Wainai today? Not how it was historically produced, but today. This is the key theme. I don't think Wendy talks enough about what Poe potentially is doing today, and she talks mostly about Poe historically speaking, but this is where your final project comes in to potentially overcome that gap. Knowing that a food like a staple dish like Poe such a, plays such a key role for the local Hawaiians in Waianae and their decolonization efforts is animated by having access to production of Poe again. The question you can answer in your final project is what are the staple dishes that play a key role in food sovereignty for the community that you belong to in Baltimore? Are there dishes like Poe that play such a key role in Baltimore as it does in Waianae? So that could be the final project, sorry, a final exam, third question for you. Uh, and I will come up with this question is, uh, compare the, uh, compare Poe to potential staple dishes that Uh, to potential staple dishes that uh, could uh, that animate decolonization efforts in Baltimore. So I'm trying to connect why not with Baltimore in this particular example, right? How might Wendy Marshall's discussion of Poe help us imagine Baltimore as a site of food oases as opposed to a food desert. Let's just say that as, as our question, like how does Wendy Marshall's discussion of Poe help us conceive, imagine, see Baltimore as a site of food oasis as opposed to a food desert? It might not help us very much. It might, there might be some limitations where you can say, well, you know, Wendy Marshall talks about Poe historically, but uh, we don't really pay, learn about how the decolonization effort happening right now that she does look at uh, uh, have access to Poe because her ethnographic work looks at a drug abuse center and she pays attention to how this drug abuse center historically was a place where people were pathologized as diseased, but now there's a woman uh, who used to have, his, uh, she, she became a psychologist, but she's different than a normal psychologist because she allows people to retell stories about their ancestors and there's this great chapter i think it's chapter five where you can pay to, when you where you can uh, see uh, how she is making people learn how to feel again because for her these feelings are the way they can overcome uh, their uh, addiction problems with alcohol etc so health is key across wendy marshall's work how much does the drug abuse center potentially use poe incorporate poe I don't know. I don't recall that come across too much. What we do know is that POE is key uh, to decolonization. So let's use that as our final exam question number three. How does Wendy Marshall's discussion of POE help us imagine Baltimore as a site of food oasis as opposed to a food desert? And then the final project for you is you're using one page, a JPEG image, 10 sentences long description of a particular place in and around Baltimore. And it has to be a place that I can locate on a map because I'm gonna make an ArcGIS map and I will share it with you. Uh, and what I want you to make an argument for in this final project is tell me how this particular place that you pick for your final project could be or is or potentially can be a site of food sovereignty in Baltimore. I challenge you to think about places that we routinely would not think of as quote unquote, a food oasis, okay? I definitely want to challenge you to think about spaces outside the quintessential stereotypical farmland because we are thinking about the city. Doesn't mean I don't want you to think about farms at all. There may be urban farms. It doesn't mean if the word farm comes up, you can't say that it's my example, but I want you to really buy into and take this argument to its extreme this argument that really to do food sovereignty, and it's an argument by Gretel van Veren, that to do food sovereignty, we need to pay attention to these vertical 
small scale, uh, deeply urban spaces, rather than large scale, widespread land, we need to think about the tight knit, the angular, the vertical, the very city kind of spaces. Um, and what are those spaces? It could be a lot of different places. I mean, if you find spaces that seem to be quintessential food deserts, and you make an argument that this could be a food oasis, you are onto something. Okay, so like a factory, for instance, we think of a factory and we say, of course, it's a food desert where it's the exact alternative, it's the exact opposite of the farm. But I want you to think about how a factory potentially could be a site of food oasis. Think about small marginal spaces. Think about spaces that would not be easy to pit, easy to locate on a map that do not fall under um, examples of places to visit in Baltimore. And surely they do not fall under the various grocery stores where you can purchase food from Baltimore, right? We see in Wendy Marshall the critique of how poi is sold in the grocery foods and the stores, but we potentially don't see how poi could be cultivated outside of this grocery store model. But you could be on, to, on the precipice of helping us understand that. You could help us understand other seeds, other staple dishes in Baltimore um, that can be grown in places outside the grocery store and that are nevertheless as deeply quintessentially urban as the grocery store, right? But different than the grocery store because they're allowing us to connect with the natural world again. How can you see that happen in Baltimore? I can give you examples, but I don't necessarily want to give you examples because I want you to surprise me. I want you to tell me what is in and around Baltimore that if you see, you will say, ah, this looks like a typical city, industrial, completely devoid of food, the opposite of a farm, but you will say, no, 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 look deeper. Imagine how this could be a side of food oasis. Imagine how this could be where food sovereignty will happen. So pay attention to those spaces. Think about the natural world that is concealed and hidden by the industrial landscape of the city and think about how people can reconnect with the natural world. It is partly exp experimental and imaginative because the site right now might not be where food sovereignty is being practiced, but in your 10 sentences, you can make a case for how food sovereignty could be practiced. And it right now might be a place where food sovereignty is being practiced. So if you're documenting the food sovereignty happening, even better, right? Because there are people in, in Baltimore, I, I assume and I expect, who are doing what Gretel Van Vieren says is happening, which is that the city is becoming the site of food sovereignty. And it's happening not because we are necessarily owning more and more land, but on the contrary, we're becoming more aware of actually the intimate spaces. We're not trying to own large size, large plots of land. We're rather reconnecting with nature on very intimate, angular, vertical spaces. And it's about that reconnecting with the natural world, with, land, with water, with plants, with seeds, with animals, with poi. Right, it's about poi. It's about the relationship rather than the ownership, and that relationship is going to make it look much more intimate, much more city-like, rather than a bygone return to the past, to the farm, to the quintessential farm. So yeah, it could be community gardens, it could be some nonprofits, it could be uh, potlucks at a church that you may find interesting. It could be some home. Uh, communal get-togethers that you're finding in backyards and people's homes, etc. Whatever it is, do find an image, a JPEG image, 10 sentences long description of how you see food sovereignty taking place in this particular location. And in your answer, you're going to muster, you're going to mobilize the insights you gain from the book, but surely you don't have to reference any of these books. You don't have to even make references to the authors. Just in your explanation of why this space is a case study of food sovereignty, an example of food oasis, you will be demonstrating to me the insights you've gained from this work, namely the way in which we think of religion. It's about that connection between the human and the non-human religion as that cultivation of that feeling, that kinship, that reciprocity and care with the, between the human and the non-human. And how does it happen in a city, a space where you don't have ownership of land, but not just that, you actually want to get away from ownership of land to a different model that is more vertical, that is more intimate, that is more small scale. Um, and 
and and and and one where we are connecting with with nature so anyways i finish off with that uh i hope this was useful for you in uh, in doing your final exams for the graduating seniors all the projects are due by monday uh so collectively for you the work is 10 sentences one answer for the final exam 10 sentences another exam for the final ex uh, another answer for the final exam 10 sen sentences on your final project and 10 sentences long on the food uh, growing project or a particular seed in that is key to your family. So you have collectively 40 sentences to write. Um, I wish you good luck and uh, stay focused and uh, stay in touch with me. If you have any questions or if you need any feedback for whatever you've written, I will be more than happy to look over. You can email it to me. The rest of you, you have more time. Uh, so start off, get going and uh, stay in touch and uh, we will meet again, hopefully next week for another Zoom chat. Bye-bye.